Good morning, everybody. Good to have you back with us again this week. Um, let's just go ahead and dive in and get started. I want you to think about uh, what's important to you, or, or maybe better yet, what's most important to you. And I want you to envision a scenario where if you were only given three requests that you could make, let's just say in regards to your prayers, three things that you would pray for and that you knew that God would grant you, what would those three things be? You can't have four, you can't have five, you can have three things. What would your prayer consist of? Now, it may take you a moment to think about that. Those things may or may not be um, at the forefront of your mind, but I want you, as we continue through um, our time together today, I want you to think about those things that are most important to you and maybe even write them down. If I could ask God three things that I knew he would grant me, what is it that I would ask for? Okay, so start writing those down. Um, and as we go through uh, our time together, um, just try and finish that list by the time that we're done. If you've not been with us, we are in a series called The Next Chapter. And we've been looking at the book of Acts. We've been walking through very slowly and methodically this book that serves as the hinge between the Gospels and the rest of the entire New Testament. And last week we were in chapter 3 where we looked at and spent some time with um, an incident that occurred between Peter and uh, a man who was born lame. He had no use of his legs. And as Peter was on the way to the temple for his afternoon prayers, he had an encounter, which was basically an interruption to his day, but he had the eyes to see, and it became an opportunity for greatness to emerge from him, and it actually changed the man's life forever. It opened doors that had been closed to him since he was an infant. Um, and then at the end of chapter 3, as the excitement grows, um, Peter launches into a prayer explaining just exactly what had happened, how it is that such a thing could have occurred. And um, many, many people as a result of this respond in faith and uh, want to be a part of what it is, this new movement that is centered around the resurrection of Christ. They want to be a part of this. They want to join Peter and John and the others and to experience what they had firsthand. So things are going good at the end of chapter 3. But as you get to the beginning of chapter 4, um, what you find is that, that not everybody is happy about the events that have recently transpired. In fact, there are people there, uh, the priest, the captain of the temple guard, some of the Sadducees who are really disturbed because um, this movement um, that is being launched and centered around the resurrection and that the apostles are now sort of at the forefront of, of um, explaining and um, really designing and guiding as this new community of faith is coming together. They have an authority and a power that threatens the status quo. Um, and anytime the status quo gets threatened, it's not going to be good on some level. And so these leaders of the temple are, are threatened. They're jealous. And they're jealous because the crowds that used to come and listen to them, uh, parse out Leviticus, are now no longer coming to their services. They're now going to the place where those who healed grandpa and grandma, those who are uh, surrounded by signs and wonders, they, they basically have found a new gig. They're, they are changing um, very quickly their allegiances and their alliances, and it's bothering the temple guard and so they're like you have no authority to come in here and preach this message and do these things like whose name and whose authority do you have don't you understand where you are and who we are and so they're threatened and basically they take and they throw Peter and John in jail until because it's later in the day and so the following morning, after they spend a night in jail, they're going to bring them out in front of the Sanhedrin, who's going to question them about what it is that's going on. And as they do, um, 
the very first question that they ask, ask them is, by whose power and whose name are you doing these things? And Peter's like, so let me just get this straight. So what we're on trial for today is for doing a good deed to someone whose life is forever altered. We're on trial today for helping a man who had never been able to walk now all of a sudden be able to run and leap and do his calisthenics. So th this is what you're charging us for. Um, we've done a good deed for a crippled man. And then as, as he continues uh, his explanation, he basically turns his defense into a, an evangelistic proclamation. He basically says to them, he says, let me clearly state to all of you and to all of the people of Israel, the guy that we just were instrumental in helping to bring about healing for this man, he said, the power came from the name of Christ. We have none of our own. It's only because of the resurrection power that's been granted through us, through the Holy Spirit from which the risen Christ has given us. It's the only reason why this has happened. So because of the resurrection, which you guys don't even believe in, because of the resurrection, because of the new life that Christ has experienced moving from death to life, this lame man has now had a resurrection of his own. And to be quite honest with you, so have we. This resurrection power is not only healing and strengthening legs that couldn't walk, it's renewing and restoring lives and characters like my own. I mean, six weeks ago, I was a scared little boy. I had no courage. I was afraid of my own shadow. I was denying that I ever even knew him. But now on the other side of the resurrection, I just, all of a sudden, I have this power, this authority, this insight that I've never had and it's all because of Jesus and so that's his defense and he says to them you would do yourself a favor to come and join the party because this is just getting started and you are not going to no matter what your authority is no matter who you think you are no matter how many degrees you have no matter what power you think you possess you have no power apart from the name and the power of Christ, the risen Christ. And so they get to this part in verse 13, which is a place where I want us to stop in just a moment. There are two places today that I think are important for us to stop and do a little introspection. The first comes in verse 13. It says, after they made the defense, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. In other words, there was nothing about these guys that stood out. They were ordinary. But in their message and in their actions and through their lives, they were extraordinary. And the only explanation that these people who were threatened by this newfound authority and power could think of is that they'd been with Jesus, that his life had rubbed off on theirs. And here's the place where I think we should stop and just think for a moment, and that is, what is it today that we are attempting to do? Like, what is it that's going on in our lives that we are attempting that could only be explained by the fact that we've been logging time with the risen one. What is it in our lives that points others to a great big God at work in us? Maybe it's our speech. Maybe our speech patterns have changed. The way that we talk to others, the way that we treat others. Maybe it's a shift in our character. I mean, what is it in our lives? Is there any evidence in our lives that could point to the fact that we've been spending time with the risen one and that he is rubbing off on us. It, it's, it's worth thinking about because as you find here in chapter four, it's not just people that they knew, it's actually enemies of those who are following Christ. It's people that don't like them. It's people who don't want to see this, but who can't help but see that there's something about the way in which their life with Christ is actually pointing people to God. 
And I just want to stop and say, is there anything in your life, in my life, in our life, that is pointing people to God, that a great big God is at work in our life? Think about who you are and where you've been. Think about the progress that you're making or not. Think about your speech. Think about your character. Think about the authority with which you live. Think about the power that you possess or don't. But when they are questioning them the following day after releasing them from jail, they just don't understand. The only thing that they can think of is that they've been with Jesus. And it's a really, really interesting place and one that I think is worthy of a little consideration of our own. Well, anyway, after they sort of stand in amazement at Peter's defense, they order them out, and then they basically start to go back and forth about, like, what should we do? Like, you know, we, we can't deny Exhibit A, jumping Jack Flash, doing his calisthenics, standing here in an upright position with them, because, because this guy who was previously lame is now a part of their posse. He's with them. So, like, he is right there, and they can't deny this. Everyone has seen this miracle, so they can't pretend as if it didn't happen. And they're afraid that if they punish them in any severe way, there's going to be a riot. So they come back out and they basically threaten them. They just said, you've got to stop this Jesus stuff. You've got to stop talking about the resurrection. It's not true. You've got to stop um, moving into territory and to places that you don't have the authority to be in. And then they said, we have nothing further. But they threatened them with an inch of their life. They said, we're going to release you, but you've got to stop it. And then in verse 19, Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We can't stop telling about everything that we've seen and, and heard. In other words, you do you and we'll do us, but we're not going to stop no matter what you threaten us with. We're not afraid of you because we've seen a man that was dead become alive. We know the power in the name of Jesus. We know the power that resides in the authority that he's given us to take his gospel, gospel message forward. We're not afraid of you. So do to us whatever you want to do. But I'm not listening to you. I have someone else who's calling my shots. So they threaten him. And they release them, and everybody is praising God for the great things that they have seen. And as they leave the trial, they move through the streets of Jerusalem, and they go to the house of several of their friends who've been watching and waiting and kind of scared, not knowing exactly what was going on, who gather together and they pray. And when they see them, they breathe a deep sigh of relief. They're so happy that... Um, that they don't have to spend longer in prison or worse. And so as they get there, um, Peter and John tell them all about the events of what transpired. And then together they decide to pray. They hold a kind of a little prayer meeting. Now, earlier I asked you, I said, I want you to write down three things that you most would want. If you had the opportunity to pray and have God grant you three things, what would you want? I want you to continue to keep those in mind, and now I want you to make a shift, and I want you to think about that being asked to the believers there in that first century. Now keep in mind, Peter and John had just spent a night in jail. They'd been threatened within an inch of their lives to stop doing what they're doing. Now, if you're in that group, would your list be different than the list that you wrote down? Would you want different things if you found yourself in that early group of believers, okay? As you think about what it is that you might want, I mean, perhaps you would want safety. Perhaps you'd want protection. Um, perhaps you would want to be spared from suffering. Perhaps you would not want to face such strong opposition everywhere you turn. Maybe you would ask for blessing on some level. What is it that you would want? 
As you think about what you might want in their space, I want you to listen to what it is that they actually ask for because they ask for three things, right? In the hopes that these were the things that were most important to them. Pay attention and see if you can get what they ask for. So, verse 29, And now, O Lord, as they pray, hear their threats, and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So, did you get what their big three were? Did you hear what it was that they were asking for? First things first, they ask for boldness. Boldness to preach God's word to their friends, to their family, to the community, uh, to their enemies. Like, first on the list of what they wanted was uh, a great boldness to preach the word of God. And if you're thinking about what that list would have been, I would think that that probably wouldn't have been at the top of my list. Because boldness is what got them into this trouble in the first place, right? Boldness is what got them thrown into jail. They didn't seem to have any problem with boldness. They seemed to have boldness down. They didn't need an extra portion of it, or did they? So when you were thinking about being in their position, would you have asked for boldness? Or better yet, when I asked you for your own big three, was boldness to declare the word of God? Was that at the top of your list? Because it was at the top of theirs. Now I want you to just think with me for a moment. The reason that you and I are having this discussion, that we're even talking about Acts chapter 4 today, is because the first century believers prayed for boldness they had severe opposition. There was really no way this little movement should have ever taken off and forget about taken off, have thrived for hundreds and thousands of years. The only reason that the gospel message that we're reading about today is part of the discussion is because they prayed for boldness and boldness was granted them. Now, what were the next things that they prayed for? Did you get a feel for what it was that they were asking for? They asked for boldness in preaching his word. And then they say, stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. The next thing they asked for isn't protection. It isn't personal blessing. The next thing they ask for is for blessing to fall on other people. They ask that God's hand would be stretched out and that through them, there would be other lame beggars who would be healed. They're asking that people who are blind would see, who are deaf would hear. They're asking for signs and wonders to follow the healing hand of God. And as they walk into uh, new places with great boldness that God would do stuff for other people. Now, when you look at that and you think about it, they're asking for God to do nothing for them. They're not even asking for personal healing. They're not asking for protection. They're not asking for blessing. They're not asking for safety. They're asking that the authority of God would so strongly reside in, in them that as they stretched out their hand, as they lived their lives and entered the various places where those who were listening and gathering to hear this new gospel message, that their lives would be transformed and changed, that people would be healed, that people would be delivered, that people would be made whole that lives would be restored and put back together. That's their prayer. Would you stretch out your healing hand so that miraculous signs and wonders would follow so that it would be a blessing to other people who've not yet met you? Their prayer has very little to do with themselves. 
And I wonder, when I asked you in the beginning, what if you could have three things granted to you from God? I wonder if your list resembles their list in any way. I wonder if the things on your heart were similar to these early believers. As you think about what it is that you want, I want you to watch and see what it is that God did. So they pray this prayer. They ask for boldness to preach the word. They ask for him to stretch out his hand with healing power so that miraculous signs can be done through his name. And then after they prayed, in verse 31, it says, The meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they preached the word of God with boldness. Now, I don't know exactly what kind of shaking was going on. I don't know what that looked like. Um, but there was clearly a response to the request. There was movement in their house. And as God moved upon them, he answered their prayers. And as they began to focus on the needs of others, there was this extraordinary outbreak of generosity that happened. We looked at that a couple weeks ago, and as you finish the chapter, we didn't read that today. But this is the place where all the believers were united in heart and mind. Everything they had, they shared so that no one was needy. People were coming, giving houses and tracts of land and just resources so that so that all of the needs of the people who were gathered would be cared for. You see, they were not focused on themselves so much as they were on the needs of others. And as they focused on the needs of others, God answered their prayers. And God used them to do great works, life-changing, transforming works in the lives of others. And so, it just strikes me as they pray this prayer and God responds to it, that the reason that God responds to it is because they're not thinking of themselves solely, but they're aligning their lives with the will of God. They're wanting what God wants, and as they want what God wants, they see what God sees, and they avail themselves to being used in doing something unbelievable, supernatural, miraculous. The way we pray is an indication of where our hearts are. And where their hearts are, are for seeing the needs of people who are greater than their own needs answered. And they want to be a part of this movement. They want to be Christ to others. And that's what God wants for them. And that's what God wants for us. So, what do you most want? And is what you want aligned with the will of God? You and I can do incredible things. We've been given the same authority by the same name to participate with God in wonderful resurrection work. And as we avail ourselves, we will see what it is that God wants us to be about. That's how God made us. God made us to see the things and participate in the things that he sees and that he wants. So as you think about that, I want us to pray. And as we pray, I want us to consider just how important it is that we align our life with the will of God. Let's pray. Oh God, I pray that you would grant us boldness. It's not something that I typically ask for, but when I think about my life and my witness, it's something I really could use on a daily basis. I pray that you would stretch out your hand of healing. I pray that where we go, that signs and wonders would follow. That as we walk in the authority given us and we focus on the needs beyond our own, that we would participate with you in something great. And that as even those who oppose us, even those who don't believe, that as they look at our lives, they couldn't help but see that we've been spending time with you.
There's just no other explanation than that a great big God is at work in our lives, doing things that we could have scarcely imagined possible. Hear our prayer this day and shake this space as you respond and lead us into the next chapter of what you want to do in our one and only lives together, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you guys. Be people of grace and peace. We'll look forward to seeing you again real soon.